Good afternoon. I am Venetia Cadogan, the director of the National Olympic Academy at the Barbados Olympic Association. Welcome to Olympians Speak. Today is day four of our Olympic Day 2020 celebrations. And we are happy to have Olympians Barbados share with us in this year's celebrations. Today with us is Frida Nichols O.L.Y., the president of Olympians Barbados and an executive board member of the World Olympians Association. And she will be chatting with three distinguished Olympians. She is a distinguished Olympian in her own right, and these three have joined her. Siebert Strong, O.L.Y., the Vice President of Olympians Barbados. Siebert would have represented Barbados at the Olympics in athletics in Seoul 1988 and Barcelona 1992. Terence Haynes, O.L.Y., represented Barbados in swimming in Athens, 2004 and Beijing 2008. And then we have Heather Gooding OLY with a very interesting story. Heather represented Barbados in athletics in Munich, Munich in 1972, but she has the distinction of being the youngest Barbadian track and field athlete to compete at the Olympics at 14 years of age. And I believe that investigations are ongoing to see if this, how far this record might be going at the global level. But it really is an honor to have you four distinguished Olympians with us. We do not hear enough about our Olympians and I'm happy to be able to share your story and then have you share that story with the rest of Barbados. So these ladies and gentlemen will be sharing with us some memories of their journey towards becoming Olympians. And I look forward to hearing from them. I hand you over to Frida Nichols, OLY. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, Barbados. Good afternoon to the rest of the world. It is a pleasure to be able to join these other three Olympians to chat with you today. Now, before we start, let me just explain this OLY. OLY, this is the designation that is given by the World Olympians Association, and it is also endorsed by the International Olympic Committee, and it is done for all Olympians who have participated at the Olympic Games who do not have any drug infractions or any criminal record. And it is seen that the road to the Olympic Games is so diverse and it is so intense that athletes spend sometimes between eight to 12, 15 years preparing and that is the equivalent, the OLY designation is post-nominal like PhD or MD, and that is granted to Olympians that then qualify. So you will see that behind the names of all Olympians who have been endorsed by the World Olympians Association. So let's get straight into this discussion. Siebert Strong, a name we all know, Terence Haynes, swimming, everybody knows that name or everybody should know that name, and by the time we're finished, you will know that name. And Heather Gooden, who was my teammate, she was part of that group of first ever female Olympians to compete at the Olympic Games. So let us start from back there, 1972, getting ready for Munich. Heather, let us know what was your road to go to the Olympic Games. Tell us that story. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, you say about preparing for it, but I cannot say I was prepared. It's just that I loved athletics, started running at an early age in primary school. After going on to Princess Margaret, carried on my athletic career. And it just so happened at the age I was at, 
I was the fastest in the 800 meters and I was chosen to go to the Olympics. I never even thought about it before. So I just got selected and that is where it started. Now, Heather, I remember, yes, you were selected, but something happened. There was a little group of 400 meter runners that were to make up that four by 14. Remember Austin Seeley, no, Sir Austin Seeley at the time made a connection to a certain coach in New York, Brooklyn, New York, called Freddie Thompson, and picked you four up and sent you over there. Explain to Barbados what that was about. Well, we went to New York to do training before we went off to the Olympics. I think we were there for about a month. And Freddie just took us to his, with all his girls or all the people that he used to train with. And we did training every day about 12 o'clock in the hot sun. That's what I remember very much about it. That you had blisters on your feet after you finished training. We would walk back to where we live and have the people now, I can't even remember the names, but it was Marcia Trotman, Lana Ford, I, I can't remember. It's Barbara Bishop. Barbara Bishop. But every day we would walk to the stadium, do our training, and walk back home. So that is about as much as I can remember about it. I can remember enjoying it as I loved the running. So no matter what time of day it was. So while Heather was in New York preparing with that 4x4 team, I was in Germany. I got a pre-Olympic scholarship to prepare in Germany in a place called Malente, and we were prepare I was preparing there. But let's take a pause now and let us go to Seabird. Seabird competed at the Seoul Olympics in 88. Now that is... 82, 82 is a whole way farther and more fresher than 72. Siebert, can you talk to us about your little journey? Well, I guess my, my journey, I guess, in back in 1988 was, uh, a, a, I guess, a good memory. I guess, um, I guess so was, so was, so was so good in so many ways because I was, I would say I was a young upcoming athlete at that time and, and, and then on the team with the likes of Elvis Ford, who I regard as my mentor and you know, running with the likes of Richard Louie and Alan Pinks on that, Alan Inks on that 4 by 14 and make it even special is that your land, my aunt was also a member of that team. So I think so was some good memories. I just say it was probably one of my, I guess I was regarded as one of my running against Butch Reynolds in the 400 meters, right next to Butch Reynolds in the lane, next to Butch Reynolds. That was, so that sold, was a very good experience for me back in 1988. But going, I would say going on to a bit to 92, it, that was the 1992 Olympic Games was my last event running for Barbados. And it, it, it wasn't the best experience I will remember because things probably could have been could have been done better because I always felt at that that we had a young upcoming athletes with a very promising you know, group of young guys but I think that you know sometimes the management always sometimes always got the but those have the same thinking as us the athletes who have to go there and do the job. And so I would say that the, the two experience from eighty eight to ninety two was I would say a little different. Games. How, how did you get there? Share your story. Uh, so I started a long time ago uh, when I first got introduced to swimming at the age of five. Uh, and that's from a water safety standpoint. Um, because my dad, at the time, he ran some of the water sports for some of the hotels. And I spent a lot of time on the beach with him. Um, so I got into swimming um, just from a safety standpoint. But... Uh, I, I fell in love with the water, and and I was uh, I am very competitive. So those two those two things uh, combined uh, kind of started my journey um, into competitive swimming. Um, and it's really after my first year of university, 
um, that I would have qualified for Athens um, in that summer of 2004. Um, I think uh, I have to say hats off and a, a lot of, uh, I guess, appreciation and, and respect goes out to both my coaches, um, Tony Fernando, who's a coach here still, and then Byron, Byron McDonald um, from the University of Toronto, who really, they, they really helped me, um, you know, reach, reach that standard uh, in 2004. And then, um, you know, I was 19 turning in 20 at the time in 2004. So very, very young and very experienced um, on the international scene. Um, so that first Olympics was very, um, it was a learning experience. It was a lot of nerves, um, made a couple of mistakes. Uh, my, my performance wasn't uh, my best performance. Um, but coming back in 2008, um, four years later in Beijing, I think um, I had a lot more experience uh, racing internationally. And then I had a, a, way, a way better performance on, in doing so set a national record um, at, 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 at Beijing, so. Okay, now, now when you actually got to the Olympic Games in, well, you went Athens, could you, you just share? Because we, we know that there are a number of um, NAPSAC level athletes that would be listening and BSAC level athletes as well that would be listening. Explain to them what exactly the experience is like to compete at the Olympic Games in your swimming event. It was very exciting at the time. I mean, um, you know, a young, young, young athlete uh, arriving at the Games Village and, you know, seeing persons that you would normally see on, on television or you hear about, you know. So for me, it was seeing people like, um, you know, Serena Williams and you know, Roger Federer and at the time was saying both and so on. And I think the atmosphere was just so um, electrifying and there was so much appreciation for the athletes from the spectators. And for me, that was, um, you know, just an awesome and, and humbling experience as well. And, you know, it made me realize that, okay, now, you know, you're really considered, you know, you're at the, the top of the top right now. And, um, you know, I, I still have fond memories up to today of, you know, the opening ceremony, um, pre-competition, nerves, um, closing ceremony, um, meeting, meeting people from all over the, over the world. Um, so definitely, definitely some fond memories and um, one of the highlights of my life uh, to date. Now, Siebert, you are not only an Olympian, having competed as a competitor, you're a coach. What would you say to athletes? Because they, they're going to need some real pet talking and, and guidance and support coming out of this particular situation. And yes, they're not alone. This is happening to athletes across the world. But what would you say to our athletes now and any athletes who across the world could be listening as well? Where do we go from here as an athlete? Well, I can use myself as an example. I remember back in 1986, I was, uh, as a junior athlete, was, um, I, was, I was selected as a member of our Commonwealth team to go to Scotland. And we all can recall that we didn't, we didn't attend the games, you know, they had the issues, I think, with the bombing. So Barbados didn't attend that game and those, not those competitions. I would have been disappointed because, I mean, I would have been loved to be at the Commonwealth Games representing Barbados as a junior athlete. And I can remember the following year in 1987, I was also was selected on as for our Pan American Games team. In that, I think those games would have been held in Indianapolis. And because one of the members was got injured, I didn't get to go, I didn't, I didn't attend those games also. But I, I said, you know something, I just said, look, I didn't lay down and cry and suck it up um, and said, look, my career is over. That enabled me to work even harder and get even more focused and as I said, in, you know where we, where, where we were in 1988. And then for me to then have a really successful period of, of career as a, a, very, a very good career between 88 and 92, represented Barbados. So these things happen. I mean, in life, you got to live with disappointments, but it's just how you manage those disappointments. I think the important thing is to have good people around you that can you know to, to share those experiences with you. 
And, and for you yourself to be able to say, look, I got to motivate myself towards the future because even in your work, your work, working life, you every day is not going to be the same thing. And there are going to be days that you are not going to be happy with your boss, but you could still got a job to do. So, I mean, I, will, I know I would like to encourage all the, the young athletes that in life, you have to learn to live with some kind of disappointment in your, in your life. And, and just and make it make it stronger because and be motivated and know that come next it come for come from September no because I mean your season was shut down in March I have to go back and work even harder in order for me to reach back reach back to the level I will reach higher and going forward that I wanted to ex um, uh, what I wanted to execute in 2020. Chatting to those younger swimmers about what they need to do if they are going to set a goal to represent Barbados probably first at Corifta, then the larger games like Pan Am's Commonwealth, and then perhaps even look at setting that goal to compete at the Olympic Games. I think um, one, of, one of the starting points in order to achieve any sort of success is really identifying what what you want and specifically what you want i think i've, I've had conversations with athletes um, in the past and they would say well i want to be i want to be fast or i would i want to you know win but not not their go they would have goals but the goals are not specific so i would say the first the starting point is having having measure measurable goals which are specific and be, being able to write those goals down right so so what i used to do in, in my career, what used to help, I used to have uh, my short-term goals in terms of times for the season, and then I had my long-term goals, uh, which would be either uh, every year or every two years um, as well. And this is something that I would write down and you know place on the back of my door. So every morning I, I, I wake up, I, I see it. It's, it's there. It's constantly there in your face. And I think having those goals written down um, it, it gives you a level of focus, uh, a, a discipline that allows you to um, go a little bit further than just saying, you know, you want to swim fast or you want to run fast. Uh, so having, I think having measured and specific goals, which you write down and you look at daily, definitely help uh, take you the extra mile in terms of separating you from being competitive to be to becoming an internationally recognized athlete, whether it's at you know international games or at the Olympics, um, and then secondly, I would say the next important thing is really surrounding yourself with uh, like-minded athletes. Um, you know, you know, everyone's heard the same birds of a feather. Um, so if if you are <clears throat> surrounding yourself by persons who are maybe not into sport or not even interested in the sport then the chances of you getting distracted from your goal or from your objective, you know, is a lot, a lot higher than if you surround yourself by persons who are like-minded um, and, and have similar goals to you. And then um, in that case, once you surround yourself with those people, what I find has happened, which has happened for me, is um, you kind of, um, you form like almost like a, a, a symbiosis where you kind of push each other, you know, you, you push each other and you help each other along. And, and for me, those those two things, um, you know, have, have really helped me. And I, I would ad advise, you know, young young athletes, no matter what sport they're in, to to, to try to um, you know surround themselves with <clears throat> peers that, that have similar similar mindsets as well. Now we've always been hearing about athletes competing. But obviously, there is a need to balance education and sports. That, that is a discussion that is ongoing. What was, um, how, how do you see that? Do you see that as being important? Um, is it something that you had to struggle with or find as a challenge? Um, and what would you suggest to athletes today that are competing, but yet need to maintain their academic standing yeah i think um i think it's definitely challenging trying to trying to balance academics with uh with sport um 
and you know people say it's either one or the other but i don't i don't i don't i don't i don't believe in that i think it all boils down to, to the discipline that you have and time, time management skills i think luckily for me when i was when i was younger in the earlier part of my career and my teens and so on my, my parents really ensured that i i had the structure uh where you have a, a set schedule and you just and you just follow it so you wake up in the morning 4 45 get ready go and swim before school you know get to school you know you're at school from nine to three go back to the pool in the evening swim from four to five sorry four to six uh, after swimming you do a little bit of dry land or stretching or strength training and then you go home and do your homework go to bed and, and you and you repeat that and it may seem a little rigorous for for someone may say well you know a kid is a kid they should have some time but i think once you have that structure at an early age it makes it easier in life to balance other stuff that, that life throws at you um, so i think having a structure from early helps you to balance helps you to balance um you know the academics and the, and the sporting element i think one also one thing that's helped me a lot uh, but more in the college level was having professors or um, teachers that were sympathetic to, to the, you know, the fact that you, you did compete. Sympathetic to the fact that you did compete um, for, you know, for, for, you know, the swim team or for your country. And then they were able to defer, you know, let's say you had an assignment that was due, but it was due during a weekend that you had, you know, your, your NCAAs or you had, a very important competition, they would give you an extension. So there was some leeway. So having professors and teachers are, are, are understanding of the, the, the importance of sport um, also make, made it easier to balance as well. And Seabert, what about your experience with that balancing of when you were in college and even when before you got to college, when you were in secondary school, balancing academics and your sport? Well, I mean, during, during my time, I, 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 I mean, people think of me as an athlete, but I do love cricket real bad, too. Ah. So I, I tend to, to want to play more sports than academics when I was when I go, going to school. But I mean, at some time, you had to say, look, you, you have seen some of your friends probably moving on to the next level. You say, look, I got to change the way how I'm thinking. But I think going to college, Changed my whole whole outlook about how 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 we got to function with life, and I mean, I started saying, it's a set schedule, especially when you go to college. Nothing really changed. Every day is probably the same thing, and as I said, I, I think what was good at college is that you have some good support systems around you, in terms of where the the, the athletics um, department puts good systems in place because they want you to graduate from college at the same time perform at the high level for the university too. What I always advise students at, um, at, my, at, school, at, at my school is that I always say to them, high school will prepare you for adult life. So if you do not have good habits in high school and, and you are, your intention is to go on a scholarship, you're going to have some serious problems. So you got to put all those things in place here in Barbados first because if you go, if you leave Barbados with bad habits and go on a scholarship and you can run as fast as you want, but if you do not do well in the classroom, you will take the next play home to Barbados. So that is something I always try to push, as you say, because one thing about American co the coaches in USA, they will recruit athletes from Barbados because we will do well in the classroom and we usually get the job done all around. It's not 100%. But I would say it's probably in the 90s. Coming back to work now, it's, to me, it isn't the same, but yet it is the same kind of thing, if you understand what I mean. We have to wear the mask and stuff like that as you go into the hospital, because I'm not working in the main hospital. I'm working over by HR on the other side of the road, by the Best of Santos lab, right opposite to that. So when we go over to the main entrance, we have to have the sanitizer, the temperature, and all that kind of thing. So, but work-wise, is the same for me. Okay, so 
we, we have an idea now of that journey that you have taken. Um, what I want to do now is to ask you to just explain how the sports experience has allowed you to navigate once you have finished competing, how you are dealing with the challenges in life so that we can connect our upcoming athletes to some examples of how they can overcome and make the best out of not a great situation? Well, for me, my, I would like to be still running now, but in England, when I was in England and my training, winter training always used to go great. But when I came out of winter training to start running, I used to find it really cold. So I had a few injuries, hamstring trouble, and stuff like that. I did not start running till after I had my daughter, which was 36 years ago. But since I've been back in Barbados, I've found that I have knee problems, which both knees I've had operations on, and it's still painful. But to come out of actual athletics, I think the youngsters now need to find the path that they need to go and follow it to the best that they can. I, to me, I don't think I did that. I always thought I wanted to be into coaching, but I did not do the courses in England that I needed to do. As I said, I didn't have anyone to say to me, you need to do this or you need to do that. I had to find my way myself, which, because my grand and grandfather enjoyed me running, but they didn't understand that you need to do both academics and sports together. Same with my mom in England, supporting me in everything I did, but as I say, didn't do the, to me, as far in my academic career that I should have. So I think in, the kids of today need to do that and follow the path they need to, where they, the goals they need to set and where they would like to finish up after athletics. Now, parents, for, for swimmers, um, your, your schedule is, I always think it is kind of brutal. 4.45 in a swimming pool, is it heated? No, no. Exactly, no, a cold swimming pool. And then, yeah. you, you know, looking at the students today, both at the BSAT and the NAPSAT level, they are going to school, and then after that, they have to come back to the, the swimming pool. And it is, it is a seriously tough schedule. And then you are saying you have to maintain your academics. Talk to our young athletes now about what is the reward that you get? You went to the Olympic Games. So talk to them about the rewards of putting in that kind of work and where it can take them, not just to Olympics and competition, but life afterwards in a career. Yeah, I think um, the benefits from being in any sport at the competitive level, um, you know, from, and specifically in swimming, the amount of, the amount of time you have to put in is um, out of all the other sports. I think the only other sport that puts in the same amount of time is at that, at that level in terms of um, the, just hours as uh, gymnastics. And I think, um, you know, besides the obvious benefits like scholarships and so on, um, and being able to travel and meet people from different walks of, 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 of life and so on, I think one of the benefits is just the, what people like to call the soft skills that you develop. Um, so just being, just being, being disciplined and uh, being able to goal set, uh, time management. I think, um, you know, coming out of sport, you then have these skills, not to say that the other, other persons don't have these skills as well, but I think 
those skills um, from a former athlete are are so developed that it gives you it gives you an advantage in the in the working world. Um, just in terms of the same goal setting, discipline, time management, um, and being able to adapt to, to failures and, and and having a positive outlook. Um, certainly, those those have helped me in my in my entrepreneur entrepreneurial journey um, because much like sport, like you may set out to do something and you have it in your head that it's going to come out this way, but it doesn't, or it doesn't, you know, and then you have to learn how to, okay, how do I go back to the drawing board and then um, adapt so that I can, I can achieve, achieve, achieve my goal. So um, definitely, and I could, I could list all these different um, adjectives that it, <laughs> that it teaches you, but uh, tenacity, tenacity is one as well. And, and grit, um, adaptability, discipline, hard work, all these things are, are, are skills I think are not highlighted enough when people talk about sports in general and what and the benefits of the benefits of sport, you know. Um, I think additionally for me what I would what I would say is that um, and I heard Siebert mention it earlier is you know you still once you're in sport you, t- you kind of you can come back to it. So like I, I still try to maintain a healthy a healthy lifestyle, right? And I think being in the sport and being in a sport, it kind of at least triggers your mind to, to 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 make you realize that sport is important not just to compete and to win, but you know from from a from a health right. standpoint as well. And I think, um, especially in our society, that's you know that's that's something that is is important as our society moves more into, you know, the social media slash sedentary, sedentary lifestyle, um, you know, and you're having higher incidences of childhood obesity and all these non, other non-communicable diseases. I think being involved in sports at an at a early age um, can help slow down that rate, um, you know, for, for, for us as, as, as an island as well. And see, yeah. right now we are wrapping up um your your final comments. Uh, I was well, Terence. Ter- I remember to Terence. I remember him as a swimmer back in two thousand and four. We had some good times at, at Athens, and I must say that sports has enabled me to offer me opportunities. Not only uh, well, I had them as an athlete, but I would say as an administrator. When I returned home, I would have served on the the, the the a, well, the AAB of Barbados now uh, in, in different areas. And I, I would have mean it has enabled me to be carry my some, some skills to, to be in the, the chairman of the National Sports Council, being on the management team of the Christchurch Foundation School for the past 18 years. And I'm certain that I would have been a sports would have assisted me in terms of making some wise uh, decisions in terms of shaping the lives of, I would say, now. Thousands and thousands of, of um, young people in Barbados, not only at the Christchurch Foundation School, but you know, I offer advice to a lot of young, other young people in the Barbados society. Where you probably even need it more now, more than ever. So, I mean, I will say that I have been very fortunate, and I'm, I'm thankful that you know that you know sports enable me to travel the world. You know, it, give, it have given me a lot of opportunities. You know, I must say that. One of the things I must say that I had some, I have all types of good people in terms of people who advise me, not hold only here in Barbados, but in the in the, US, in the USA setup. When they give me good guidance in terms of in order me to shape me, making some wise decisions, and they remain long term friends because sports enable you to have long, long, long friends and respect. You know respect in terms not only in, 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 in our city in entire world because people will never forget you because everybody's not going to win a gold medal or silver medal might even get in the finals but I mean all of us who, who have uh, represent Barbers this small nation and in terms of at the Olympic Games just think about the type of promotion that we would have given Barbados in, in assisting in what people want to know find out where is this country Barbados and they would have visited Barbados over a long, long, long period. So the thousands and thousands of tourists would have seen us compete at the Olympic Games and have come and visit Barbados. So 
I mean, but I just say that I think that we as Olympians, we, we are thankful. I think we have done well for our country. And I'm certain that we will continue to serve in any capacity going forward for the future. And Seabird and Terrence and Heather, I could not agree more. Um, sport, certainly um, being an Olympian, it assisted me in the transition to our embassy in Washington. And then I went off to our consulate in Toronto. The academic part allowed me to then be a tutor at the Ruby Open Campus for 30 years. And in addition to that, the connection then opened the doors for me to do other things like marketing where I went to the Port of Bridgetown, an amazing experience. Sport opened those doors like for all of us and all we can say as Olympians to athletes, set your goals, be organized, manage your time, keep focus, go after your dream, let nothing stand in your way, always find an opportunity and a way to deal with the challenge so that you can come back out better than ever and represent that flag of Barbados on the international scene once again. Thank you very much everyone and we wish all of you success and be safe.